Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and you're all very welcome to uh, this webinar with Matthew O'Toole, who's uh, a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, member of the SDLP, uh, representing South Belfast. Um, my name is Dahi O'Kelly. I'm chair of the uh, UK group in the Institute. Uh, and uh, we, we have, as you know, discussed the protocol from time to time. And I'm really delighted that Matthew is here to discuss it uh, with us. Uh, he's written extensively about it. Uh, he's debated extensively about it. Uh, and he has uh, relevant experience. He spent six, seven years as a civil servant uh, in the British administration, uh, in the Treasury, uh, in the Ministry for Justice, I think, but most importantly, uh, in number 10, uh, under both David Cameron and Theresa May. Um, he's been a member of the Assembly since uh, 2020, uh, when uh, he, he replaced uh, Claire Hanna, uh, who is now an SDLP member uh, of the House of Commons. Uh, Matthew, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the Institute. Um, your opening speech, I understand, will be between 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we'll take questions uh, between now and two o'clock. So Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dahi, and um, uh, delighted to um, delighted to be with the IIEA um, today. I'm um, uh, pleased to be here. I won't th run through my own biography because um, I spent too much time explaining my own somewhat unique um, uh, relationship to Brexit and how I ended up in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, but the IIEA has um, uh, been at the heart of unpacking the, the hellish complexity of uh, the UK's exit from the EU for the past five years. Um, but while in principle I'm delighted to be at the IIEA, an extraordinarily important um, part of the discourse uh, in Ireland, in practice I wish I was here discussing something else. Uh, this week of all weeks is a reminder of the gravity of the policy dilemmas facing uh, the international community over the coming decades. In Glasgow, leaders are discussing, and we hope progressing, new commitments to address systematic climate breakdown to ensure uh, that there is a planet habitable for humans in the decades to come. As all thinking people now accept, there is no greater or more fundamental policy challenge for us in our lifetimes. But if we do manage to stave off a truly catastrophic rise in global temperatures, there are other imponderable but unavoidable challenges for policymakers. The revelations from Facebook whistleblowers over the sheer scale of harm being done by that company's products has crystallized for many people the uneasy feeling that the relationship between the tech industry and the common good has become hideously imbalanced. And as new technology advances uh, more generally and inexorably and brings social, economic and psychological disruption yet unimagined, the question of who will advance or defend a public good separate to the determinations of tech giants will become ever more pressing. And of course, linked to both of these challenges, is the question of whether economic growth, if we are to have growth, can be more broad based and indeed more just than liberal capitalism has achieved in recent decades. That last theme was of course uh, touched on extensively by Secretary Yellen <coughs> and indeed Minister Donohoe uh, in their remarks at the IIEA yesterday. But of course, none of these subjects is what I'm here to discuss today. And that is precisely my point. The futility of Brexit is perhaps best represented by the opportunity cost for those actors most closely engaged in it. To put it mildly, we should all have more important things to focus on. We all do have more important things to focus on. Secretary Yellen yesterday quoted Beckett, and powerful though her quotation was, I can't help thinking that Samuel Beckett would be even more aptly referenced in relation to Brexit. For what is Brexit, but a kind of theater of the absurd in which language is increasingly detached from meaning and the actions of key characters, notably the British government, become ever more detached from any apparent logic. Today, I want to briefly summarize uh, the current context around Brexit and the protocol and their impact on the politics, not just of the three strands of the Good Friday Agreement across these islands, but some of the broader geopolitical context. To put it in summary, things are worrying. I believe, uh, my party believes that uh, where we should end up and where we can end up 
is making a virtue rather than a curse out of Northern Ireland's unique position at the hinge point of the UK and European Union. We believe that's possible, and that's what I and my party are working towards. Uh, but currently, the evidence from London is not encouraging. If we could be assured the UK government was pursuing a policy of seeking practical flexibility under the aegis of the existing withdrawal treaty and its protocol, and then seeking to make it work for everyone in Northern Ireland, that would be one thing. But the current signs are that the UK is not simply trying to increase flexibility, but rather to entirely reframe the nature of the withdrawal agreement. If the UK government has chosen a path of destabilisation and escalation, it is important to be clear and resolute about the facts of the past five years. The reality of Northern Ireland in 2021 and the need to hold firm in the face of provocation from ideologues. Lest I be accused of simply taking sides against London, let me be clear that there is a responsibility on the EU side too, and one that it could have handled better in January when its precipitous near triggering of Article 16 prompted unwelcome instability. But the cynical misuse of that hastily corrected error by the UK government ever since points to the true balance of blame for the unstable position we now find ourselves in. In case any of you have been trying to avoid the subject of the protocol, which is quite understandable uh, and indeed possibly even advisable, uh, if you don't have to directly uh, spend your professional lives working on it uh, or to give it its proper name, uh, the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, um, I will summarize briefly uh, what the protocol is and why it exists. Uh, the protocol is the set of provisions in the UK's withdrawal agreement with the European Union, which relates to uh, Northern Ireland and indeed the island of Ireland. Uh, specifically, it, it ensures that Northern Ireland remains uh, substantially inside the single market for goods. But it is critical to note Northern Ireland is only in the single market for goods, not for services, capital or people. I've often found that one of the most important things when discussing the protocol is um, explaining the limits to the protocol. Uh, the only substantial areas of uh, the only substantial exceptions to this are in the area of the single electricity market where EU law continues to apply in Northern Ireland with the not unreasonable um, the single electricity market, I should say, um, which relates to the whole island of Ireland. Um, we share a, a grid, for those of you who aren't aware, um, one of, the, one of the, the outstanding and notable achievements in terms of uh, cross-border cooperation over the past 20 years. Um, uh, and in this area, EU law continues to apply in Northern Ireland with the not unreasonable intention of ensuring um, uh, seamlessness and stability of electricity supply. There are also uh, important and as yet untested guarantees in terms of rights in the protocol. But in economic terms, um, the protocol is uh, largely limited to keeping Northern Ireland in the single market for goods, uh, but, also, um, uh, um, but also ensuring that Northern Ireland in effect stays in the EU customs territory, even though it is um, uh, de jure in uh, the UK customs territory, which is a slightly complex Schrodinger's cat arrangement um, but it is important to point out, as I say, the limitations. I'll come back to the point about the limits on the parameters of the protocol, because all too often, lazy assertions about the scope and scale of the protocol are left unchallenged. Uh, suffice it for, for now to say, it palpably and clearly does not entail, uh, quote, an economic United Ireland, to use uh, an expression favoured by some of its antagonists. Um, if I could just offer an example in parenthesis, it would be, um, the uh, effective um, uh, closing down of what was um, one of the most durable parts of the all-island economy, even when uh, the border on this island hardened 100 years ago, and that was uh, the financial services industry. What we are seeing at the minute is um, financial services um, uh, uh, institutions effectively um, divesting from one side of the border uh, to, the, uh, to the other. Um, uh, the three main uh, All-Ireland banks, Bank of Ireland, AIB uh, and Ulster Bank, have all uh, substantially um, reduced their cross-border activity. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it's my view that that simply can't be um, uh, separated from, from Brexit, despite um, some of the public uh, statements or the lack of public confirmation of that. Um, but why does the protocol exist, to come back to that um, question? Well, in narrow process, process terms, it exists because uh, the European Union acted to protect a series of interrelated interests, including the conditions or some of the conditions for all Ireland cooperation as envisaged in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and yes, 
the integrity of the EU single market and Ireland's place within it. Uh, and in, in that case, I do, of course, mean Ireland the state rather than Ireland the island as a whole. Uh, but of course, Northern Ireland remaining in part of in parts of the EU single market and in effect in the EU customs territory means that the deeper the disalignment between the UK, the UK here meaning Great Britain and the EU, the greater the potential for disruption in the movement of goods between Britain and Northern Ireland. Is this a good thing? No. Disruption in trade flows between Britain and Northern Ireland are not a good thing. But if we sip, simply separate out the impacts um, on the protocol, the, the protocol's impacts on east-west trade from the broader disruptions of the UK leaving the EU, we are making an obvious conceptual and practical mistake. Whether we like it or not, the protocol is a consequence of the UK's decision to leave the EU and the specific manner of exit that the UK chose. Indeed, one of the most acute reasons why the protocol uh, had, the, had a difficult birth at the beginning of this year were a succession of UK choices. The protocol landed on people and businesses not after a prolonged period of planning, consultation and preparation, uh, but after just a year of transition, a year in which the UK refused, a, a period, a transition period, which the UK refused to extend despite the uh, explicit offer from the, the European Union uh, for that to happen, and despite us being in the middle of a once in a century pandemic. And during that year of transition, the UK government had mostly downplayed the practical consequences of the protocol. Indeed, in a command paper published in uh, May 2020, it sought to begin the task of redefining and um, uh, correcting from its perspective um, the meaning of the protocol just months after the withdrawal agreement was signed. Uh, and of course, the UK and European Union only concluded negotiations on the trade and cooperation agreement in the days leading up to Christmas 2020, when, uh, as I'm sure everyone on this uh, call will remember, all of us had uh, other things on our minds. Um, it's sometimes easy because there have been such a litany of irresponsible actions by the UK government to uh, forget how individually irresponsible some of those uh, actions were, in my view, refusing to extend the transition period, um, even by a few months during the um, pandemic, uh, is one of the less discussed but more uh, egregious of uh, the UK government's decisions. But thankfully, that uh, trade and cooperation agreement, um, uh, scanty though it is, um, was signed uh, because the alternative was much worse. If there hadn't been a baseline zero tariff, zero quota trade agreement between the two sides, uh, what is now called the sea border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland would have been much, much harder. I won't go through the many ways in which it would have been harder, but suffice it to say, um, if tariffs and quotas were applied to goods moving between uh, Britain and Northern Ireland, we can we can but imagine how economically uh, and politically difficult that would have been. Uh, this points to another hard truth. The future of the protocol is inextricably bound up with broader UK-EU relationships. As we've seen in the past few days, the operation and even the existence of the protocol becomes very quickly dragged into disputes over issues as apparently distinct as French-British fishing rights. From the perspective of critics of the protocol, this is a reflection of its inappropriately expansive terms they believe that the original negotiating mandate of the European Union was too broad. They believe that the definition of a hard border is too weighted in favour of uh, Irish nationalists or at least pro-European narratives. They believe that the emphasis placed on protecting the all-Ireland economy now and in the future is misguided and possibly even a violation of Northern Ireland's constitutional position in the UK. Many of these points uh, were made forcefully in a policy exchange paper released yesterday. Uh, for those of you who didn't see it, I think it's worth examining. The fact that Lord Frost wrote the forward to that paper would indicate a high degree of sympathy with that view uh, at the head uh, of the UK government. But in response to these points, and perhaps particularly for an audience in Dublin looking east and north and wondering what the hell is happening, I think it's important to be clear. 
That analysis is wrong. There is no hard sovereignist solution to the issues of Brexit thrown up for Northern Ireland. Indeed, those issues were themselves first created by the hard sovereignist politics of Brexiteers like Lord Frost. And I'd say also in parenthesis, the idea that the All Island economy has been exclusively uh, preserved in ASPIC through Brexit is, I'm afraid, rendered uh, totally false by, as I said, the fact that Northern Ireland only remains in the single market for goods. No uh, meaningful uh, uh, all island economy. Uh, we, in no way could you say that the all island economy has been left untouched when our immigration rules are now dramatically different. And um, when our financial services, um, the context in which our financial services operates is dramatically different. The context in which the entirety of services, which is, of course, uh, about 80 percent of both the UK and Irish economies, is now divergent in a fairly dramatic way. Um, nor, um, it is important to say, is there mass disturbance in Northern Ireland over the protocol? Um, and this is a really important point to make because um, uh, given that we live in an age of um, uh, instant uh, social media communication, it can be very easy for people to uh, create shock and spectacle on social media. Uh, the appalling actions of mindless thugs in burning uh, a bus in Newton Ards uh, yesterday does not represent broad-based unrest, despite the um, uh, appalling nature of that um, of that act and the uh, traumatic consequences for the public servant affected by it. Street protests, um, even those uh, at the height of the summer, after the easing of COVID restrictions, attracted hundreds rather than thousands or even tens of a thousand, or even tens of tens of thousands of attendees in Northern Ireland. Now, that is not to say that there are not varying levels of frustration, ranging from outright anger to mild displeasure from unionists who dislike the principle underlying the protocol. That principle is that Northern Ireland, at least in some areas, should be treated differently from the rest of the UK. But even with the protections of the protocol, uh, there also there also remains the abiding frustration of many people I represent at the principle of Brexit itself. As I said earlier, Northern Ireland is only in limited parts of the EU single market. Northern Ireland, and it's important to say this slowly, I think, is no longer in the EU. Unfortunately, from my perspective, uh, as a result of a popular mandate derived overwhelmingly from one part of a multinational state and applied with brutal sovereign supremacy over the other parts of the United Kingdom. The only reason Northern Ireland now has special arrangements is because the UK's counterparty in the withdrawal negotiations insisted upon them. In January 2017, the position of the UK government in its first detailed Brexit policy statement, which was the Lancaster House speech, was merely that there would be, quote, no return to the borders of the past, along with some allusions to the maintenance of the common travel area. But uh, as those of you who followed these issues closely over the years will know, the common travel area was largely until Brexit. It's been slightly beefed up now, a series of administrative conventions, um, some uh, agreements, uh, intergovernmental agreements, but largely a series of uh, administrative conventions, um, which was given the title of the common travel area, but but didn't quite um, did not quite have the status of a, um, a of a grand constitutional arrangement that the UK government sometimes gave it. Without clear demands in those years from the Irish and EU side, the upshot of the UK position would substantially have meant a border in goods on the island of Ireland. And yes, it's important to say again, um, and it's frustrating to have to say it all these years on, but that would have been hugely regressive for both jurisdictions and people uh, on this island. The truth is that public opinion in Northern Ireland is more nuanced and open-minded on the protocol uh, than you would be led to believe by certain overwrought commentary from London and elsewhere. Um, the latest polling commissioned by Queen's University points to a small but seemingly increasing majority in favour of the protocol. But perhaps more instructive than that number is the more than two thirds of people who believe that some form of distinctive arrangement from, for Northern Ireland is necessary to reflect our unique geography and political dispensation. So where do we go from here? My hope is that the performative sovereignism from London is just that a performance building up to a compromise. But I can't say at this stage that this hope is anywhere near an expectation. Certainly the expansiveness of the EU's offer on uh, easing uh, some of the practical mitigations in terms of the easing some of the practical east-west consequences 
um, uh, in terms of goods movement is not just welcome, uh, but should be transformative. And there are particular issues that needed to be resolved. And um, I, I think particularly of issues like the movement of medicines into Northern Ireland from Britain. Um, those are areas where practical mitigations and agreed solutions were necessary and essential to make the protocol work. There are other areas where I do think it would be in all our interests to see even more progress. For example, we think more ambition on engagement and consultation with Northern Ireland's devolved institutions would be welcome. We hear a lot in um, the discourse now um, in London, Belfast and elsewhere about the triggering of Article 16. I'd like to hear more discussion about the triggering of Article 14. Uh, which um, uh, allows for representations on areas of relevant protocol implementation to be made by the North-South Ministerial Council. Uh, sadly, the, uh, the fact that the North-South Ministerial Council is not uh, operating as comprehensively as, as it should at the minute is um, uh, one reason why that hasn't happened yet. Um, as usual in discussing the protocol, I've spent far too little time talking about the very real economic opportunities that arise from uh, Northern Ireland having access to both EU and UK markets. The truth is that what the protocol can mean, if interpreted and applied in its most expansive and generous sense, is that Northern Ireland's duality, so long a source of strife and conflict, could become an advantage. So we would like to see more dedicated strategy binding in not just London and Brussels, but investment agencies in Dublin and Belfast to maximize the investment opportunities for the North and indeed the whole island. This, of course, could complement the vision of Ireland's um, uh, bridging position between uh, Europe and, uh, and the US that was um, exp expanded upon by Secretary Yellen yesterday. But all of that is subject to the scaling back of the bleak sovereignty obsessed vision of Lord Frost and the current UK government. Put simply, bre post-Brexit, and indeed in relation to everything else in Northern Ireland, there is no positive future for Northern Ireland or our Ireland more collectively, or our, or our island more collectively, if framed in a narrow vision of hard sovereignty. Uh, I will draw my remarks to the conclusion of that. Thank you, Dahi.